Pope Francis and climate change. Pope Francis has recently released an encyclical in, entitled Adato Si, uh, pardon my Latin if I've got it wrong, in that uh, he argues that climate change is real and that this solution involves social change as well as environmental activism. At one point, he argues for rest on Sunday, which some have seen as a precursor to enforced uh, Sunday observance. And of course, for Adventists, that sometimes uh, resonates more than for others. And the question is, is this just paranoia? Or is it warranted for us to be worried about that? So in order to tell, I th we will start by looking at what was written. Um, the reference is there and it's available online apparently from the Catholic Church and interestingly in English. Uh, it has an imprimatur on it. I'm assuming that that was uh, what they did and it's entitled on care for our common home which is English interestingly not Latin. Um, and I, so I assume that this is their translation of it. Laudato si, mi signor. Praise be to you, my Lord. In the words of this beautiful canticle, St. Francis of Assisi, for whom Pope Francis is named, by the way, the first Pope Francis, reminds us that our common home is like a sister with whom we share our life and a beautiful mother who opens her arms to embrace us. Praise be to you, my Lord, through our sister Mother Earth, who sustains and governs us, and who produces various fruit with colored flowers and herbs. This sister now cries out to us because of the harm we have inflicted on her by our irresponsible use and abuse of the goods which, with which God and has endowed her. We have come to see ourselves as her lords and masters, entitled to plunder her at will. So you can see we're already starting in with uh, uh, the question of uh, environmental uh, and in, in, um, in paragraph three, the numbers are the paragraphs, um, and they're in the original by the way, global environmental deterioration, he talks about and uh, then he says, in this encyclical, I would like to enter into dialogue with all people about our common home. So this is not just addressed to church members. This is addressed to everyone, including uh, those who have no religion at all. I'm going to take the first thing and, and separate it into uh, various uh, uh, groups and uh, this is the first chapter um, and uh, give you a kind of my quick summary and then some quotes that will help you to see I think that the the uh, the short summary I give is in fact uh, a reasonable summary of what he has to say uh, the first Part of this, I will say, is that climate change is real. Those are my words. Um, but in chapter 15, or paragraph 15, he says, I will begin by briefly reviewing several aspects of the present ecological crisis with the aim of drawing on the results of the best scientific research available today. Um, so he's, he's leaning on the scientists for this one. Um, there's a section entitled Climate as a Common Good, and under that section, uh, paragraph 23 says, a very solid scientific consensus indicates that we are presently witnessing a disturbing of the warming of the climate system. In recent decades, this warming has been accompanied by a constant rise in the sea level, and it would appear by an increase in extreme weather events, even if a scientifically determinable cause cannot be assigned to each particular phenomenon. So he's kind of hedging his bets just a little bit there. Uh, humanity is called to recognize the need for change of lifestyle, production, and consumption in order to combat this warming, or at least the human causes which produce or aggravate it. 
It is true that there are other factors, such as volcanic activity, variations in the Earth's orbit, and access to the solar cycle. Yet a number of scientific studies indicate that most global warming in recent decades is due. So he's talking about global warming, not just climate change. In recent decades is due to the great concentration of greenhouse gases, carbon dioxide, methane, nitrogen oxides, and others, released mainly as a result of human activity. And he talks about fossil fuels. And then a little later he talks about deforestation, which presumably also adds to greenhouse uh, gases. A, he talks about a circular model, uh, which apparently is in contrast to, uh, it's, it's more of a recycling model. Uh, if present trends continue this century, may well witness extraordinary climate change. That's interesting spelling of climate. Uh, and an unprecedented destruction of ecosystems with serious consequences for all of us. A rise in the sea level, so he's, it's pretty standard climate change, global warming scenario. There's been a tragic rise in the number of migrants seeking to flee from the growing poverty caused by environmental degradation. And notice that's the very next paragraph. So obviously at this point, he is talking about uh, 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 ecological migration, uh, uh, which has been touted in, in, in the press for some time. Um, now, I'm going to stop putting um, uh, ellipsi green ellipses in front of every single quotation, um, but because uh, so, sometimes I don't quote the entire paragraph. Uh, uh, but if it's in between, I will put a, an ellipse as I have here uh, so that you can uh, see that I'm actually, uh, you know, I quote straight through if I start quoting with, unless otherwise marked. Next paragraph, there is an urgent need to develop policies so that in the next few years, the emission of carbon dioxide and other highly polluting gases can be drastically reduced, for example, substituting for fossil fuels and developing sources of renewable energy. We all know that it is not possible to sustain the present level of consumption in developed countries and wealthier sections of society where the habit of wasting and discarding has reached unprecedented levels. Now, notice that it talks, it puts the global climate change, or more precisely global warming, in the same section as the throwaway society, which is technically a different subject. Climate change is related to pollution in general. He sees this all as a complete whole, and in fact, one of the uh, uh, titles of his uh, sections is Pollution and Climate Change. So uh, Pollution Waste in the Throwaway Culture is a subsection title. And he talks in that section about drinking water. And he says one particularly serious problem is the quality of water available to the poor. Dysentery and cholera, he says, underground water sources in many places are threatened by the pollution produced in certain mining, farming, and industrial activities, especially in countries lacking adequate regulation or controls. And remember, he's a global pope, so he's got to think about the people in South America as well as the people in the United States. Um, and this uh, is his own italics. Um, Yet access to safe, drinkable water is a basic and universal human right, since it is essential to human survival, and as such is a condition for the exercise of other human rights. I'm not sure how you do that. I, I'm sympathetic to the, to the sentiment, but uh, uh, how do you make sure that people in the Sahara have access to safe, drinkable water? Uh, some of the people may not be able to get it regardless of how hard we try. Um, and I don't like human rights that can't be fulfilled. It's, uh, 
you know, human right not to be killed, that's a little bit easier to control by other people. Um, and paragraph 31, he talks about control of water by large multinational national businesses may become a major source of conflict in this century. So it sounds like he's aiming for the large multinational businesses rather than, uh, let's say, uh, general uh, human care. And he talks about loss of biodiversity, which of course is another uh, thing that's blamed on global warming. In fact, there are proposals to internationalize the Amazon, which only serves the economic interests of transnational corporations. So again, you see the corporations are coming into, uh, uh, are being aimed at. Talks about uncontrolled fishing. This is for human beings. And this is actually a quote, so those are his ellipses there. To destroy the biological diversity of God's creation for human beings to degrade the integrity of the earth by causing change in its climate, by stripping the earth of its natural forests, or destroying its wetlands for human beings to, to contaminate the earth's waters, its land, its air, and its life. These are sins. So we have now elevated ecological uh, behavior into uh, the realm of morality. And he says technology is not the answer. Again, that's my summary, but the most extraordinary scientific advances, the most amazing technical abilities, the most astonishing economic growth, unless they're accompanied by authentic social and moral progress, will definitely turn against man. So if you don't do social and moral progress, your technology will not be the answer eventually. Although change is part of the working of complex systems, the speed with which human activity is developed contrasts with a naturally slow pace of biological evolution. <coughs> Excuse me. Which is, of course, a, uh, a uh, nod to um, standard scientific theory. Um, keep that in mind when we read some other passages that are going to sound remarkably biblical. Uh, technology which linked to business interest is presented as the only way of solving these problems, in fact proves incapable of seeing the mysterious network of relations between things and so sometimes solves one problem only to create others. So don't expect to solve this with technology. Greater investment needs to be made in research aimed at understanding the more fully, more fully the functioning of ecosystems and adequately analyzing the different variables associated with any significant modification of the environment. At one extreme, we find those who doggedly uphold the myth of progress and tell us that ecological problems will solve themselves simply with the application of new technology and without any need for ethical considerations or deep change. That's why he doesn't like technology. It doesn't uh, do anything about ethical considerations or deep change. At the other extreme are those who view men and women and all their interventions as no more than a threat, jeopardizing the global, global ecosystem and consequently the presence of human beings on the planet should be reduced in all forms of intervention prohibited. You can't farm because that would be an intervention. Um, and the idea of uh, not having more people is not an option. Um, which is interesting. That's the point of divergence between Pope Francis and uh, uh, many of his uh, more secular uh, colleagues. Um, he talks about less consumption and more recycling is needed. In other words, uh, decrease the demand rather than, again, trying to do a technological solution. Uh, nat he talks about the natural environment and the social environment, and he says both are ultimately due to the same evil, the notion that there are no indisputable truths to guide our lives, and hence ba human freedom is limitless. He doesn't like that idea. The warming caused by huge consumption on part of some rich countries <clears throat> ha 
has repercussions on the poorest areas of the world, especially Africa, where a rise in temperature together with drought has proved devastating for farming. And he's going to rail against consumptive society, especially rich consumptive society. My predecessor, we're going to go back to uh, paragraph six, my predecessor, Benedict the 16th, likewise proposed eliminating the structural causes of the dysfunctions of the world economy and correcting models of growth which have proved incapable of ensuring respect for the environment. And I assume that those are kind of capitalist uh, proposals. He doesn't say that very clearly, unfortunately. Um, he, he's talking about St. Francis of Assisi above, shows us that, shows us just how inseparable the bond is between concern for nature, justice for the poor, commitment to society, and interior peace. So this is all part of one thing and can't be separated out. Uh, he talks about social justice being linked to ecological justice, the intimate relationship between the poor and the fragility of the planet. He speaks about in six, uh, 16, uh, he talks about the decline in quality of human life and the breakdown of society. This is part of the same picture, the way he sees it. Global inequality. Today, however, we have to realize that a true ecological approach always becomes a social approach. It must integrate questions of justice in debates on the environment so as to hear both the cry of the earth and the cry of the poor. Instead of resolving the problems of the poor and thinking of how the world can be different, some can only propose a reduction in the birth rate. Again, he's against that. At times, developing countries face forms of international pressure which make economic assistance contingent on certain policies of reproductive health. Keep in mind that um, his church believes both in not having abortion and also in uh, not having contraception. He talks about weak responses, harmful habits of consumption. A simple answer is the increasing use and power of air conditioning. And I thought that doesn't sell very well in Southern California. Um, I wish I could give you more about that, but I've included basically all there is about that little throwaway simple example. Um, he talks about a variety of opinions, and then just as uh, mentioning in passing, uh, because it's interesting to me, I thought I would note that in paragraph seven, he talks about the beloved ecumenical patriarch Bartholomew, with whom we share the hope of full ecclesial communion. So there is, I guess, hope for reuniting the Eastern Orthodox Church with the Catholic Church expressed early on in this particular section, which by the way does not have a title as we will see. Uh, the next thing is chapter two and if you go back you say, well where was chapter one? You won't find it. The Gospel of Creation. And at this point, I'm going to go through it more or less consecutively, uh, pulling out stuff that I think that you might find interesting, certainly stuff that I found interesting. Um, there's, I'm going to read the section titles even if there isn't anything in them. The Light Offered by Faith, Section 2, the, biblical, uh, the Wisdom of the Biblical Accounts. In the first creation account in the book of Genesis, God's plan included created, creating humanity. After the creation of man and woman, God saw everything that he had made and behold, it was very good. The Bible teaches us that every man and woman is created out of love and made in God's image and likeness. Well, that could go to uh, a conservative Christian, even an Adventist uh, uh, a pulpit without any trouble. Uh, the creation account in the book of Genesis contain, in their own symbolic and narrative language, and he's going to pull back just a little bit about that, profound teachings about human existence and its historical reality. 
They suggest that human life is grounded in three fundamental and closely intertwined relationships with God, with our neighbor, and with the earth itself. According to the Bible, these three, three vital relationships have been broken, both outwardly and within us. This rupture is sin. The harmony between the Creator, continuing the same paragraph, uh, humanity and creation as a whole was disrupted by our presuming to take the place of God and refusing to acknowledge our creaturely limitations. This in turn distorted our mandate to have dominion over the earth, uh, Genesis 1.28, to till it and keep it. As a result of the, the originally harmonious relationship between humans and human beings in nature became conflictual. It is significant that the harmony with which St. Francis of Assisi experienced with all creatures was seen as a healing of that rupture. And those of you who know the history of St. Francis of Assisi will realize that um, he's well known for being in harmony with nature. Thus, God, re uh, continuing on to the next paragraph, um, towards the bottom of the paragraph, thus God rejects every claim to absolute ownership. The land shall not be sold in perpetuity, for the land is mine, for you are strangers and sojourners with me. Uh, Leviticus 25, 23, and uh, that has to do, of course, with the uh, year of Jubilee. Although the wickedness the 71 is a particularly interesting paragraph. Although the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and the Lord was sorry that he had made man on the earth, nonetheless, through Noah, who remained innocent and just, God decided to open a path of salvation. So apparently the Noahic story is regarded as uh, authoritative and presumably true. Um, in this way, he gave humanity the chance of a new beginning. All it takes is one good person to restore hope. The biblical tradition clearly shows that this renewal entails recovering and respecting the rhythms inscribed in nature by the hand of the Creator. We see this, for example, in the law of the Sabbath. On the seventh day, God rested from all his work. He commanded Israel to set aside each seventh day as a Sabbath of rest. This is the same paragraph as in Noah. Uh, a Sabbath. Similarly, every seven years, a sabbatical year was set aside for Israel, a complete rest for the land. When sowing was forbidden and one reaped only what was necessary to live on and feed one's household. Finally, after seven weeks of years, which is to say 49 years, the Jubilee was celebrated as a year of general forgiveness and liberty throughout the land for all its inhabitants. Uh, there's the Sabbath for everything. Continuing the paragraph, this law came about as an attempt to ensure balance and fairness in their relationship with others and with the land on which they lived and worked. At the same time, it was acknowledged that the gift of the earth with its fruits belongs to everyone. Those who tilled and kept the land were obliged to share its fruits, especially with the poor, with widows, orphans, and foreigners in their midst. When you reap the harvest of your land, you shall not reap your field to its very border, neither shall you gather the gleanings after the harvest. And you shall not strip your vineyard bare, neither shall you gather the fallen grapes of your vineyard. You shall leave them for the poor and for the sojourner. In the Bible, there's another paragraph, the, same, the, the God who liberates and saves is the same God who created the universe. And these two divine ways of acting are intimately and inseparably connected. Ah, Lord God, it is you who made the heavens and the earth by your great power and by your outstretched arm. Nothing is too hard for you. You brought your people Israel out of the land of Egypt with signs and wonders. Again, the ellipses are his. The best way to restore men and women to their rightful place, putting an end to their claim to absolute dominion over the earth, is to speak once more of the figure of a father who creates and who alone owns the world. Otherwise, human beings will always try to impose their own laws and interests on reality. The mystery of the universe, get into paragraph 81, human beings, even if we postulate a pos process of evolution, yeah, we gotta live with that, also possess a uniqueness which cannot be fully explained by the evolution of other open systems. Each of us has his own, or her own personal identity and is capable of entering into dialogue with others and with God himself. 
Uh, does that mean we should support, at least in this area, intelligent design? I don't know. It would be interesting to push press um, Pope Francis on that question. When nature is viewed solely as a source of profit and gain, uh, capitalism as worshipped in some places, this has serious consequences for society. This vision of might is right has engendered an immense inequality, injustice, and acts of violence against the majority of humanity since resources end up in the hands of the first comer or the most powerful. The winner takes all. Completely at odds with this model are the ideals of harmony, justice, fraternity, and peace as proposed by Jesus. As he said of the powers of his own age, you know that the rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and their great men exercise authority over them. It shall not be so among you, but whoever would be great among you must be your servant. The message of each creature in the harmony of creation, I, I'm just gonna skip over some of this because it's not um, as germane. You, it's, it's okay, you can read it. Um, a universal communion. We have only one heart and the same wretchedness which leads us to mistreat an animal will not be long in showing itself in our relationships with other people. Every act of cruelty towards any creature is contrary to human dignity. And that I think you can support with the biblical record. The common destination of goods. Whether believers or not, we are agreed today that the earth is essentially a shared inheritance whose fruits are meant to benefit everyone. For believers, this becomes a question of fidelity to the Creator, since God created the world for everyone. Hence, every ecological approach needs to incorporate a socialist perspective which takes into account the fundamental rights of the poor and the underprivileged, the theme that we've seen before. The principle of the subordination of private property to the universal destination of goods, universal destination of goods goes to everybody, uh, and thus the right of everyone to their, own, to their use is a golden rule of social conduct and the first principle of the whole ethical and social order. And uh, I guess one question is, does the government uh, have, an, have a role in forcing this? That is why the New Zealand bishops asked what the commandment thou shall not kill means. You will cite bishops from various places. Uh, in fact, most of those references are to, to uh, bishops or popes or uh, doesn't have much in the way of references to outside sources. Um, thou shall not kill means when 20% of the world's population consumes resources at a rate that robs the poor nations and future generations of what they need to survive. The gaze of Jesus, I'm going to skip over that. Chapter 3, the human roots of the ecological crisis, technology, creativity, and power. The globalization of the technocratic paradigm. Um, Referring to some techn technocrats, uh, they are less concerned with certain economic theories which today scarcely anyone dares to defend than with their actual operation in the functioning of the economy. They might, may not affirm such theories with words, but nonetheless support them with their deeds by showing no interest in more balanced levels of production, a better distribution of wealth, concern for the environment, and the rights of future generations. Their behavior shows that for them, maximizing profits is enough. So, again, it sounds like a, uh, certainly robber baron capitalism is getting n nailed here. A science which would offer solutions to the great issues would necessarily have to take into account the data generated by other fields of knowledge, including philosophy and social ethics. But this is a difficult habit to acquire today. So science needs to take into account philosophy and social ethics, which uh, is interesting. All of this shows the urgent need for us to move forward in a bold cultural revolution. So the end of this sounds like cultural revolution. I've heard that term before. Uh, the crisis and effects of modern anthropocentrism. 
since everything is interrelated, concern for the protection of nature is also incompatible with the justification of abortion. Boom. So uh, though he's speaking to everybody, he's obviously carrying, uh, uh, pointing out Catholic ideals. Practical relev relativism. When human beings place themselves at the center, they give absolute priority to immediate convenience and all else becomes relative. So we need to not put ourselves at the center, I assume. Uh, the need to protect employment. Seeing manual labor as spiritually meaningful proved revolutionary. I think I've heard of the Protestant work ethic. Um, and, uh, but anyway, in various countries, again, I'm skipping over a few paragraphs there. In various countries, we see an expansion of oligopolies for the um, production of cereals and other products needed for their cultivation. This dependency would be aggravated were the production of infertile seeds to be considered. That is, seeds you can sow, grow, but the, when they are harvested, you can't use their seed uh, later on, and I agree with uh, him on this particular thing, the, eff the effects would be to force farmers to purchase them from larger producers. So he's again it, and uh, again, I am too in that particular area. Chapter four, integral ecology, environmental, economic, and social ecology, cultural ecology, ecology of daily life, the principle of the common good, justice between the generations, not saying anything he hasn't said before as far as I can tell. Chapter five, lines of approach and action, dialogue on the environment in the international community. So what are we gonna do about it? We know that technology based on the use of highly polluted fossil fuels, especially coal, but also oil and to a lesser degree gas, I assume that's natural gas, but I'm not totally sure, needs to be progressively replaced without delay. As the bishops of Bolivia have stated, the countries uh, which have benefited from a high degree of industrialization at the cost of enormous emissions of greenhouse gases have a greater responsibility for providing a solution to the problems they have caused. Dialogue for new national and local policies. Unless citizens control political power, national, regional, and municipal, it will not be possible to control damage to the environment. That almost sounds like arguing for democracy, no? Um, it's the only place that I found in the text that, uh, that this pops up. Dialogue and transparency in decision making, politics and economy in dialogue for human fulfillment. And in paragraph 193 we read, we know how unsustainable is the behavior of those who constantly consume and destroy while others are not yet able to live in a way worthy of their human dignity. That is why the time has come to accept decreased growth in some parts of the world. <clears throat> in order to provide resources for other places to experience healthy growth. Which is interesting. Religions in dialogue with science. It cannot be maintained that empirical science provides a complete explanation of life, the interplay of all creatures, and the whole of reality. Again, it sounds like uh, um, uh, intelligent design argument. This would be to breach the limits imposed by its own methodology. Chapter six, ecological education and spirituality entitled uh, one for towards a new lifestyle, two educating for the covenant between humanity and the environment, person who could afford to spend and consume more but regularly uses less heating and wears warmer clothes, shows the kind of convictions and attitudes which help to protect, protect the environment. So if you wanna know what you do, you turn your thermostat down and you uh, wear a jacket around the house. Uh, 2.13, he talks about family. In three, he talks about ecological conversion. Uh, four, he talks about joy and peace. Love overflowing with small gestures of mutual care is also civic and political. So we get involved with that, I guess. And it makes itself felt in every action that seeks to build a better world. 
love for society and commitment to the common good are outstanding expressions of a charity which affects not only relationships between individuals but also macro relationships, social, economic, and political ones. That is why the church set before the world the idea of a civilization of love. Social love, continuing the paragraph, is the key to authentic development. In order to make society more human, more worthy of the human person, love in social life, political, economic, and cultural, must be given renewed value, becoming the constant and highest norm for all activity. In this framework, along with the importance of little everyday gestures, social love moves us to devise larger strategies to halt environmental degradation and to encourage a culture of care which permeates all of society. When we feel that God is calling us to intervene with others in these social dynamics, we should realize that this too is part of our spirituality, which is an exercise of charity and as such matures and sanctifies us. Not everyone is called to engage directly in political life. So that whole first par the paragraph I just read has to do with political life apparently. Social society is also enriched by a countless array of organizations which work to promote the common good and defend the environment, whether natural or urban. Some, for example, show a concern for a public place, a building, a fountain, an abandoned monument, a landscape, a square, and strive to protect, restore, improve, or beautify it as something belonging to everyone. I guess this is volunteerism. Sacramental signs and the celebration of rest, and here's where we get into the question at hand. In paragraph 235, he talks about baptism, the Christian East uh, talking about baptism and beauty. Um, I'm not sure I can connect those really easily, but it's that's a paragraph. The next paragraph talks about the Eucharist, which as you know, occupies a special place in the Catholic Church. And then paragraph 237 which is the one that we're particularly interested in today. On Sunday, our participation in the Eucharist has special importance. Sunday, like the Jewish Sabbath, um, is meant, do we allow Jews to keep the Sabbath for the same general reason? I don't know. Is meant to be a day which heals our relationship with God, with ourselves, with others, and with the world. Sunday is the day of the resurrection, the first day of the new creation, whose first fruits are the Lord's risen humanity, the pledge of the final transfiguration of all created reality. It also proclaims man's eternal rest in God. In this way, Christian spirituality incorporates the value of re relaxation and festivity. So it sounds like he's calling for a day of rest, not just a day to go to church. Now, uh, this paragraph is a long one, so uh, we'll see further parts of it uh, down the road here. We tend to demean comp contemplative rest as something unproductive and unnecessary. But this is to do away with the very thing that is most which is most important about work, its meaning. We are called to include in our work a dimension of receptivity and gratuity. I'm assuming that that means gratitude, which is quite different from mere in inactivity. Rather, it is another way of working which forms part of our very essence. It protects human activity, human action from becoming empty activism. It also prevents the unfettered greed and sense of isolation which makes us seek personal gain to the detriment of all else. The law of weekly rest forbade work on the seventh day so that your ox and your donkey may have rest and the son of your maidservant and the stranger may be refreshed. Rest opens our eyes to the larger picture and gives us renewed sensitivity to the rights of others. And so the day of rest, centered on the Eucharist, sheds it, I assume that means its, it is it in the original, I looked it up to be sure, light on the whole week and motivates us to greater concern for nature and the poor. And that's the paragraph. Um, the Trinity and the relationship between creatures, there's a couple, three paragraphs on that. Um, the Sabbath paragraph outside of the Trinity is the longest section of this particular part. Uh, then there's a section on the Queen of all creation, which of course is uh, 
Mary, the mother of God. And then there's this final section that talks about beyond the sun. Even now we are journeying towards the Sabbath of eternity, the new Jerusalem, towards our common home in heaven. And that's the last I'll quote of this particular uh, paragraph, it, it, uh, this particular work. It, that's most of it, really. Um, now my take on all this is I think the current pope believes that global warming is real. I think there's little question about that. Uh, certainly he represents himself as believing that. I do not think this is based on his own original research. If you read that, you find absolutely no arguments for it. It's just uh, all the scientists say this, we should believe it. Uh, he adds it to more traditional ecological concerns, seeing them all as kind of a lump. And if you don't believe in global warming, then obviously um, you're not a complete eco ecologist. He is skeptical of cap capitalism, especially uh, untrammeled capitalism. I must confess I'm a little skeptical in that regard as well. Uh, particularly its ability to be environmentally responsible. Um, he seems to have a distributionalist ethic, and in that sense, he seems to agree with the idea that a Green New Deal uh, needs to be redistributionalist and not simply uh, dealing with uh, global warming itself. He does seem to accept democracy, but doesn't seem to like the results of it, which is interesting. The people being in charge, are imp it's important, except when they go against the environment themselves. Um, he complains that some greedy people use up all the resources, and some greedy nations in particular, but sides with others with much greater populations that are poised to use resources at the same rate, and therefore, because of their size, in massively larger quantities. And it's interesting to ask if we don't deal with, for example, China and India, which are massively increasing their carbon footprint, um, how we're ever going to get global warming under control if that's our real goal. He sees the cure as a spiritual one. He sees Sunday observance and specifically a day of rest, not just church going, as an appropriate response to global warming. And I think this is the part that kind of rings alarm bells to some Sabbath keepers in particular. Uh, what room is there for Sabbath keeping as opposed to Sunday observance? It is not clear whether he would make an exception to Jews or for Sabbath keeping Christians either. He kind of mentions it as if that's the old way of doing it and um, we should all be doing it on Sunday now. That, of course, uh, uh, again, that raises some interesting questions for uh, Sabbath-keeping Christians. I see this twist as new, but the fundamental principles not much different from previous church positions. I, uh, this could have been really pretty much predicted, except for uh, the fact that he's going to go all in on global warming, as far as I can tell. The church is still fighting secularists in some important aspects. This is not a simply the church going into a secularist mode. Uh, in, in the matter of abor abortion or birth control, it doesn't specifically mention birth control, it does mention abortion. Um, it appears that the church uh, is not going to knuckle under to secularism. Um, frankly, I'm glad they're not. Uh, and, of course, in God's existence and the relevance of theology, and it almost sounds like he's tiptoeing up to intelligent design. Um, but there are obviously common interests, and I think that he's trying to make common cause with, cert with a certain section of society that has decided that global warming is the way to go. Now, I, the conspiracy theorists uh, and, and they may be partly right, even though um, 
even though they may not be completely right, I think it's very possible the devil has figured out how to make things uncomfortable for a lot of people, and he may have designs in this particular area. But at least as I read this, the church is not openly following uh, those designs. Um, and I, I think it's obvious that the church is under the influence of evolution, the, the Catholic Church. Um, but I think the church still likes the implications of the creation account, which is interesting. Um, I, I personally have trouble with the authority of the church to change the day of the Sabbath, and of course that's where the church's position is that, yes, you can't find it in the Bible, but we changed it. Uh, he doesn't say that in here. That's obviously taken from other Catholic uh, teaching. Um, what about the first premise, global warming? As that's the one that probably most of you are most interested in at, at this point. I, I think there's a lot of dust in the air, including the term climate change, which is, you know, the, the problem was originally called global warming. When you start talking about climate changes, I'm from Missouri, the climate changes all the time. Um, you know, what's really being discussed is global warming. I, I think there are some propositions that are available to anybody trying to be objective regardless of what side you start out with. Uh, one of them is, the carbon dioxide is, in fact, a greenhouse gas. It does absorb uh, infrared light. Uh, that's, I think that to deny that is just crazy and betrays one's lack of objectivity. I think also, though, that carbon dioxide cannot warm the Earth enough by itself. If you do calculations as to how much difference it makes, it's about a quarter of the effect that is being claimed, maybe an eighth, depending on what variables you use. Uh, and so all of the global warming uh, scenarios claim that there is a positive reinforcing effect because carbon dioxide can't do what it's claimed to do alone. And that's just objective truth. The biggest greenhouse gas is water vapor, and anybody who studies it, I think, will have to acknowledge that. And of course, we're not going to fix water vapor, not with 70% of the Earth being covered with water. I think, uh, furthermore, although strenuous argument will be made about this, I, th I think that if one is being objective, one has to say computer models are not, in fact, evidence. They might be evidence of where people are coming from, but they're not evidence of how nature behaves unless the model happens to nat match nature, in which case nature is what tells you what's going on. I, I think that a significant amount of the data has been fudged. Uh, people who've been critical of global warming can point to areas where stations have been moved from areas where it was cool to areas where it got hot or uh, stations have had pavement put around them, which of course is going to influence the temperature. But I think also that stations where this has not happened uh, do show some global warming. Uh, if I have to put my personal bet just looking at the data I've seen, I would say about half of global warming that is claimed is probably not uh, real. It's an artifact, but about half of it, in fact, is real. Uh, but, but we can debate on, on how much is real and how much is not, but it's not, it's not unrealistic to say, uh, look at the data more carefully. And not just the data, but where it came from. Um, in the sixth part, I think there has been significant, significant global warming in the historical past. Uh, recently, one can look at the 1800s where there was a year without no winter. We don't have those years right now. Uh, but also, in the medieval period, one can show that, in fact, 
uh, the climate was warmer in the medieval period. All you have to do is look at the name Greenland. At least the edge of it was green at one point. Vinland, which is the Vikings name for Newfoundland. Vines in Newfoundland? Are you kidding? Well, apparently not. Uh, agriculture was quite a bit warmer. And one of the things that has been denied on one side is that um, this medieval warming period occurred. And the reason why, of course, is because if you say that it has occurred, then saying that when it gets warmer, everything will go to pieces. Well, it didn't go to pieces in the medieval era, and uh, so why are we uh, that worried? Um, and you have to combat that. But I think Michael Mann is wrong with his hockey stick. Uh, and finally, I think that we have to say that climate alarmism has happened in the past. And all you have to do, if you're my age, is remember back to the 1970s when we were told that there was an ice age coming. That's climate alarmism. It's a matter of fact. It's a matter of record. Now. That doesn't prove that what we have now is climate alarmism. But what it does, I think, say is that you can't just take what all the scientists are saying without, um, uh, shall I say, uncritically. Because it's just, it's happened before. It is reasonable to ask if it's, it could happen again. Now. I think there are certain requirements for global warming to take us to Sunday observance or, for that matter, to a Green New Deal. And the first thing is you have to establish that significant global warming is happening. If you don't establish that, then, of course, uh, uh, there's no push to put us somewhere else. And that's some place that people will attack, and with, not without reason, as we've noted. Uh, carbon dioxide contributes significantly. Um, one of the things that's interesting is that Mars has, a, a, has experienced some global warming. And of course, <clears throat> the number of diesel trucks on Mars is probably zero. Um, so I think that uh, we have to be cautious about you know, the influence of the sun and some other things as well. The next, thing, the next thing you have to establish in order to make a case is that this is bad and will spiral out of control. And I think that we have to be a little careful with that because of the medieval warming period. Um, it didn't spiral out of control and it, for some parts of the world it was bad, for some other parts it was not. Uh, and it's interesting to ask what happened to the uh, uh, sea level at that point. The final, uh, it's actually uh, next to the final point, is that you have to establish that there are no technological fixes. And that deserves a discussion in and of itself. Are there things we could do to keep the earth from getting too warm? Um, and if somebody's not interested in talking about that, and there's some interesting evidence behind that, then I think that um, maybe we're looking for people who are trying to use this to force us to do something that might not be a good idea. And then finally, I think that you have to ask, is the prescribed cure worth the pain? And that's something that, uh, that some people don't want us to look at. And I think you have to, in order to say that we should do something about global warming, you have to establish all five of those premises. Now, the thing that bothers me probably the most about global warming, and I, I guess if uh, people were labeling me, they would have to call me a skeptic, um, is the hypocrisy of the whole thing. And the reason I say that is because in a certain sense, I'm not a skeptic. I have solar panels on my house that supply almost all my electricity, and it may be able to supply them all in the reasonably near future. The only reason that we don't have 
more of them is because the state won't let us, which is weird if you think about it. If we're really worried about global warming, why not let everybody that can put up solar panels and put up all the solar panels they want to? But the state of California won't let you do that. I know, because we tried. I drive a Prius. It gets 50 miles per gallon, over 50 miles per gallon. I drive it carefully. I recycle. I'm a vegetarian, bordering on vegan. That's one of the claims that we have about, you know, we really should get global warming to, to work because methane actually is a uh, bigger greenhouse gas than uh, carbon dioxide in terms of uh, how much of it, it uh, how much difference it makes. Um, I rest uh, to the point of what we've been talking about today. I rest every seventh day. So, you know, don't come to me looking at uh, why I should do something different. I'm really not interested in people lecturing on me when they do not practice what they preach. If they're not vegan, if they're not driving a Prius or maybe a Tesla or something, if they don't have solar panels, I don't want them talking to me until they fix their own problem. And I've had people do that. Um, and I'm not interested in virtue signaling. I don't care about doing stuff because it makes us look good. Jesus had some rather severe comments about praying and giving alms because it makes you look good. And frankly, I think that that's probably true for uh, being ecologically conscious. If it's not really working, this is nuts. And I am particularly incensed to find out that uh, the recycling stuff, they're just dumping in the regular landfill because it's too expensive to sort it out. Then why make me separate it out? But if this is about control only, and there's some reason to suspect that, I think it is morally wrong to do what has been done. Um, but uh, that's my opinion. Now it's your turn. Yes, comment here. Well, <clears throat> thank you for tackling <clears throat> this subject. I personally find it very interesting. You, we just kind of breeze past the common good, and there's a lot wrapped up in the concept of the common good in, in the Catholic Church. And I, I read a, a good article here entitled Catholic Social Thought and the Common Good. And really, when, when, a, when the Pope talks about common good, what it means is that that they see it as, as reaching its full potential in the political community and in legislation. So anything they deem pertinent to the common good has its end goal in politics and in legislation, and that, that's what he's done with climate. It is now a matter of common good. So that means there's, you know, the fangs of legislation are gonna be in there, at least in his mind, and then he's couched the Sunday rest in with a solution for climate change pertaining to the common good, which also gives that the potential to become a legislative uh, property. So even though he may not overtly be calling for laws for Sunday observance, the, the language is already there. The, the, the building pieces for it is already there because they've already identified it as being a matter of common good and in their social thought, that means legislation. That's just the next step. Yeah. Comment back here. Leonard. Well, I think it's, it's very interesting. And I, I, whatever one thinks about, clim about climate, climatic warming, war global warming, uh, to me, it's obvious that the, the world is in serious trouble. Uh, I mean, you just take, you could list a whole lot of things. Take plastics and, and, and recycling and how those relate. I mean, we're, we're causing a, a major disaster and I don't know how we'll ever deal with it. And, uh, <clears throat> you know, the, the I, and I really don't think that our society, the governments, have the will or the courage to do something about it. 
And so I agree, I agree with him, it's a serious problem. And uh, probably his approach is inevitable that, that this would, that would happen. Uh, that somebody will then try to control what we do. And the social change has to be, has to happen, serious social change, and we don't have the guts to do it. And so, you know. What that means is that if we're gonna have to legislate it, and if our legislators won't do it, then the world legislator will have to do it for us because eventually we're gonna to need to be forced into this. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yes. We know from prophecy, oh, biblically, biblical and our God speaking through our modern day prophet, that the world, that the condition of the earth is, is deteriorating, that natural disasters are increasing, even though a lot of people say, well, there were a lot of disasters in the past, et cetera. But you hear people talking on the front line, say about these, about fires, they say, I've never seen anything like this, as fast as it goes. Yeah. I believe mm -hmm. there are indications, and we know, we've been told, do we believe our prophets, that this, and Jesus himself, that these things are gonna happen, and I can just, I think that works right into the, the Pope's uh, agenda, that he can use that to fulfill other prophecy. That's, I may have a, a, you know, to me that's what it boils down to. Yeah, well, I mean, one of the things that I see, for example, is uh, that there, there are people who don't want the problem solved because then they can try to use it to, uh, to influence others. And uh, just to give you the best example I can, uh, it's been known for a long time that if you, uh, if you take out dead trees, forest fires don't spread as bad. Take them out. Thin the forest a little bit, and then, and then when it gets dry, it just doesn't jump as fast. And it's not as hard to put out. And, uh, and yet, this, the state of California hasn't tried that relatively easy fix because, I don't know. And see, it bothers me. See, one of the problems of virtue signaling is that it's too easy to, to use fake actions instead of the real one that you really need to take care of. Um, virtue should be something that you aim at, not something that you try to convince other people that you're aiming at. Yes. It is so interesting how it seems that different issues get wound up and tied up into question of global warming, it seems quite obvious that humans pollute the earth and should figure out ways to quit doing that. Um, I too have become in recent months or years somewhat skeptical of this uh, broad picture that get, gets painted that humans are, that human activity is leading directly to global warming. And it is interesting to note that they have stopped saying global warming, they're saying climate change now, apparently because the warming has slowed or stopped. But uh, whether that's true or not, the, the only thing that uh, I've personally come into contact with that I thought was quite interesting and an eye-opener was a wonderful cruise up the uh, Inner Passage in Alaska a couple of years ago. And we went up to Glacier Bay and spent a day at Glacier Bay on the ship, right? And they brought aboard um, several members of the National Park staff there to come aboard and tell us about the history of the area and the glacier and what it had done over the last several hundred years. I forget the name of the glacier, but this entire bay the glacier in the, I think they said in the 17th century, advanced over 20 or 40 miles in the space of a couple of weeks, swallowing up little villages of Tinglet people or the natives that lived there. And then <clears throat> beginning in, I think they said 1750, began a, a retreat which has persisted to this day. So that glacier has been retreating since well before there were any diesel engines here either. Uh, which is <clears throat> so interesting to me, and you're right, I, I understand that the polar caps on Mars are shrinking. <clears throat> uh, there are a lot of uh, unanswered questions, and maybe um, another time we'll delve into global warming in some more depth, and I'll talk about why I think there's about half of the data is uh, um, 
I hesitate to say fraudulent, but certainly uh, manipulated is probably a better way of putting it. Uh, to where, you know, you pave under a station and uh, suddenly the temperature goes up. Well, duh, you know, that kind of thing. And uh, uh, so I'd like to, you know, I mean, we have just touched the surface of the actual global warming question itself. And we probably deserve to, now that it's being used for theological reasons, it's probably worth our while to pay, pay a little more attention to it. So I'll see what I can do in the uh, reasonably near future. But, um, but I think it's, you know, pretty obvious that it doesn't go where some people think it goes, and uh, I might even venture to say would like it to go. By the way, with that comment, I'm going to let you have the last comment because um, I know there are some uh, that okay. would like to go over to that place, and I'd all like right, to be able to dismiss people long. in time. Um, we've all heard the saying, the science is settled. Laudato C takes that approach. It's settled. Right. They say, this is the right way, and we're going to do it this way. And it doesn't take a majority of people to want to do it that way. I mean, to make laws and end up at Sunday law. All it takes is a very strong global world order. Yeah. Uh, yeah. You know, and us in the minority, we're not going to be able to do or stop that part of it. We all do what we can in our own yeah. personal lives um, yeah. to keep our backyards clean. But is this covenant with humanity? Is there one in the Bible? Man's covenant with you. Uh, God's covenant. Earth. Earth's co uh, covenant between nature and humanity. There's kind of one where the charge is given to Adam to dress the garden and keep it. <coughs> and, and I think that it's uh, one of the things we have to be careful is that just because global warming may not hold as much water as people want to make it hold, it doesn't mean that, uh, that pollution in general should be ignored. Uh, you know, I can remember coming down here in 1980, in 1973, and in May, and in October one morning we looked up and you know there were mountains out there. <laughs> and uh, actually I had seen them before because I'd been here in 1971 or 72 but I had forgotten about them when we came. You know, it was all just all fogged in and couldn't really see anything. And and uh, uh, you know, it's gotten a lot better. Yeah. And I think that was a good thing. Technology did. Technology did it. That's right. The right. thing that uh, that uh, uh, you know, probably the catalytic converter had something to do with that. Uh, you know, I think that. I think that uh, that technology is good. I think if people have cars with you know better mileage and less uh, nitrogen oxide emissions, that's great. Um, I think that we should be careful if we're concerned about global warming being, being taken to bad ends, that we don't deny all, that there are people who will you know, say all five of those premise, premises are totally wrong and they're just lying. Well, that's not really true. And we need to be, we need to be more nuanced about what's going on. Uh, but on the other hand, I don't think here any more than we would in evolutionary science. We should not be bowing and saying whatever you say, sir, you know. Because the fact of the matter is that scientists can be as interested as industrialists. Um, 
and uh, you know some of it can be because they worship the earth some of it can be because that's where they get their grant money and it doesn't really matter which one uh, you have to just you have to take what's said with a grain of salt you have to go back as close as you can to the original data and even the original data you need to ask how was it collected is it reliable and which is tough because most of us don't have the ability to do this kind of thing. Um, and so what we're going to have to do is rely on sources that we trust. And that makes it really tough, too. But like I say, I, I think that if you look at it from a, from a foundational point of view, there are some things that you can say that will help you to not fall into the easy traps of just believing everything one side says or believing everything the other side says. Because, you know, uh, cor big corporations, especially oil companies, have as much self-interest as the people who are doing the other side. So, no, you want to be careful of, of believing anybody uh, I think there's Proverbs that uh, talks about that he who speaks first sounds right until the other guy starts talking. And I think that we need to, um, we need to be careful to listen to both sides, to pick apart the difference between actual evidence and persuasion on the basis of authority. Because really, Science doesn't have any, or scientists don't have any authority. The scientific data is the only thing that does. At this point, um, we'll close uh, tomorrow, uh, tomorrow, next week. We'll talk about the uh, sacrament of abortion.